Well, thank you very much. It's certainly a privilege to be here with you today. And uh, I was actually grateful to be assigned this talk because it was a nice review for me, and especially as someone who deals with students, residents, and then um, a lot of uh, fellow colleagues from the community. And so the subtitle uh, that I was handed, I, I had to think about that quite a bit to wonder, is it really the most diseased organ? So as we move uh, forward, these are my disclosures. And these are the objectives for our 20 minute lecture. So I'm gonna go over the relevant anatomy and physiology, and I'm gonna go over some data regarding association between inflammation and both uh, benign enlargement and prostate cancer. And then I'm gonna present some data regarding the microbiome of the prostate, which is an exciting area of research at present and the potential influence on the state of disease. So among the soft tissues in the human body, the prostate has the highest level of which of the following? This is one of your audience response questions. So you can go ahead and click your answers there. Choices being zinc, magnesium, cholesterol, prostaglandin E2, and sodium. All right, so the answers uh, people chose are zinc and prostaglandin E2. Very interesting. Okay, let's go to the next one. Oh, can we go back a slide? Research has noted which of the following in the majority of tested prostate cancer specimens and uh, prosthetic intraepithelial neoplasial, ne neoplasial lesions, E. coli, Klebsiella's, Klebsiella proteus, candida, or Probinobacter acnes. All right, very interesting. All right, this is going to be great. So, in terms of the anatomy of the prostate, Lousley, as in the famous Lousley retractor, initially described the prostate as having five lobes. However, unlike in the rat, humans have distinct zones within a relatively uniform gland, and it's organized like a bunch of grapes, or essentially like alveoli suspended in fibrous gelatin. And there's a variety of cell types. We have secretory epithelial cells. This is a tall columnar epithelium, so uh, we're going to be releasing a lot of proteins. Uh, we have basal or stem cells located at the base of these cells, and we have neuroendocrine cells and uh, a combination of stromal cells. So we'll have smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, and endothelial cells. And so in this schematic here, I'll try to avoid too much laser pointer work here, but you see the different zones. The ones that we probably talk the most about are gonna be the peripheral zone and the transitional zone. And this is kind of a layout of the secretory uh, component. So here are your secretory cells here and the lumens here. And at the base, you have neuroendocrine cells, basal cells, and then we have the basement membrane uh, separating these from the stroma. So the basement membrane is composed of extracellular matrix. And this is important not only for structure, but it also has a role in the development of the gland and controlling cellular functions. And it also has a, appears to have a pivotal role in the inflammatory response within the prostate. So who needs a prostate, right? Why do we need it? Well, it's essential for fertility. I mean, you could make an argument that in present day you could extract sperm and go the route of ICSI, but it serves a role as the trigger for ejaculation, activation of sperm, and capacitation. And this is an, uh, a comment here at the bottom that uh, perhaps I forgot this or perhaps I never knew this, but prostate epithelial cells are the only healthy human cells that produce energy by glycolysis rather than the Krebs cycle. And uh, we'll talk about uh, why this may be important uh, for certain areas of research and therapy as we move forward. So the prosthetic fluid is not a simple fluid, right? Number of components, so calocrines, of which PSA is one, um, uh, and was discovered in 1979, constitute a, con a significant portion. Citrate, zinc, so the prostate has the highest level of zinc of any soft tissue, so this will go back to some post-test questions, right? Um, spermine, which may protect from infection. Now prostaglandins, and I don't know why I didn't pick up on this in medical school or residency, but I never put the term prostaglandin and prostate gland together. And so it was named for the prostate, but it's actually a misnomer because they're more heavily concentrated in the seminal vesicles. Cholesterol serves to stabilize sperm. Uh, we have components that are related to the odor of uh, semen. And then acid phosphatase, this should probably say mature urologists like uh, Crawford and Donahue, <laughs> probably use this to screen men for prostate cancer at one point. So zinc, what, what is, why is this important? It gets a lot of press for a number of reasons. Certainly in fertility, we hear a lot about it, but it's accumulated within the epi epithelial cells of the prostate, and 4% of your total body content is located here, and it's possibly supported by prolactin stimulation. It blocks the Krebs cycle, and it causes citrate accumulation, which is what sperm need for energy, and it also causes temporary inactivity of the calocrines. The major transporter, called Z1P1, is either decreased or absent in prostate cancer tissue when compared to either normal or BPH tissue, and has been hypothesized as a tumor suppressor. So, 
The overwhelming majority of your testosterone in the blood is bound to protein, mainly albumin and sex hormone binding globulin, which has several different names in the literature now. So only 2% is available to diffuse within to the prostate, and the majority of that is going to be converted to dihydrotestosterone, which is uh, of a flatter shape and has a higher binding affinity for the androgen receptor than testosterone. This will then uh, go to the nucleus, and then you get transcription followed by translation. So you have a number of proteins being produced. We have our cytokines, which include several growth factors, and secretory proteins, our enzymes, of which PSA is one. Remember, PSA is a serine protease. So these cytokines will stimulate cell growth via receptors located on both the epithelium and the stromal cells. The proteins will be secreted into the lumen following neurological stimulation at the point of ejaculation. So in this cartoon, so we have a signal from the hypothalamus, so GnRH, sometimes called LHRH, will then stimulate the pituitary to release a luteinizing hormone, which then goes to the testicles, uh, and the and Leydig cells will re release about 90% of the man's testosterone. About 10% comes from the adrenal glands. So then this then diffuses, and testosterone is converted to dihydrotestosterone by 5-alpha reductase. This binds to the androgen receptor. Heat shock protein is displaced, enters the nucleus, and you get transcription and translation, and then all the great things that we're going to be talking about in more detail. So this is regulated uh, through androgens, and the gene for the androgen receptor is referred to as a master gene uh, in prostate physiology, and there are two forms, A and B, that can be transcribed, but as of yet, there's no evidence for different roles for these two forms. Um, the expression is essential for homeostasis, for keeping everything in balance, okay? And so when we talk about um, targeting the prostate, and we talk about relative hormone concentrations, it's essentially a battle to keep uh, the status quo. And over 300 androgen receptor, androgen receptor mutations have been identified in prostate cancer cell lines. So as we age, as men, or as men age, testosterone levels and therefore dihydrotestosterone levels go down. Gland function is impaired, and this reduces the ability to maintain healthy levels of zinc, citrate, and urcalocrines. So fertility will go down in many men, and this weakens the ability to inhibit the Krebs cycle, which then favors a cancer-prone status. So we know from studies on eunuchs that in addition to their wonderful voice, the prostate doesn't grow, and that uh, castration in mature males will cause gland regression, mainly through apoptosis. This is actually reversible with androgen replacement, and it's actually been shown that if you expose female embryos to androgens, they will develop prostates. So as uh, I mentioned uh, about hormone regulation and imbalance with estrogens, they actually act in concert with androgens to promote and inhibit growth. And there's an estrogen alpha receptor and an estrogen beta receptor. And they're concentrated in different areas of the prostate and appear to have different functions. In terms of innervation, uh, while there are adrenergic and noradrenergic uh, receptors within the, within the prostate, this is typically well known. I mean, everyone's pretty familiar with using alpha blockers, for example. But uh, recent research also shows that with norepinephrine, for example, you can uh, accelerate metastasis of prostate cancer in an animal model. So you may want to send your cancer patients to yoga or something. So there's evidence for multiple muscarinic receptors within the prostate, M1, M2, and M3, and they're located in different areas. And data suggests these receptors may modulate growth in the setting of prostate cancer. And so cholinomimetics have been shown to contribute to proliferation. And I'll talk a little bit more about anticholinergics as it relates to benign disease uh, later on today. So the prostate, similar to the lung and the intestine, is an immunocompetent organ. It's populated by lymphocytes, macrophages, and mast cells. And the immune responses in the prostate tissue are likely influenced by sex hormones. And this can affect the susceptibility to inflammation. So lymphocytes secrete cytokines. We talked about those already. And these can regulate growth both within the stroma and of the epithelium, both through a paracrine mechanism and autocrine mechanism. So when we start to think about hormone regulation, uh, immunoactivity, uh, clinically, remember, estrogen's pro-inflammatory. Obesity is associated with higher estradiol levels and higher inflammation. So think about metabolic syndrome, okay? And there's some data to suggest that lower urinary tract symptoms actually improve with reduction in obesity. So in the course of this talk, I mean, speaking to a room largely of urologists, many of whom I, I assume are predominantly clinical, I think that going through some of this helps to prepare, I guess, some of your reading uh, as it comes through the pike of current research and therapeutics. I know it does for me as someone who doesn't primarily treat cancer. And so 
um, trying to tie these in as we go, I have found has been very helpful for me, and I've tried to do that somewhat for, uh, here. In terms of the most diseased organ, okay, uh, it is the number one non-skin cancer and the number two cancer killer in men after lung disease. And while Soccer, who was at Wayne State where I did residency, uh, got funding and did autopsy studies, this is quite some time ago, but uh, demonstrated invasive cancer in 64% of men approaching 70 years of age. He did categorize it by decade, right? And you could see it gradually went up as men aged and you know, led to the comment that if we live long enough, we all get prostate cancer. Um, BPH is uh, the most common urologic disease in older men. So as the comment you heard from Dr. Crawford earlier, this is a highly relevant subspecialty to primary care. So nearly 50% of men in their 80s suffer from BPH. I shouldn't say suffer, we'll say have BPH. So prostate cancer BPH generally, not always, but generally form in different areas of the prostate. We reviewed the different zonal anatomy earlier. They're considered chronic diseases with slow progression and the prevalence rises with age. Both are hormone dependent and both have been associated with inflammation. So prostatitis, I find that prostatitis, it's a real condition in some men, but a lot of times it's a diagnosis that gets attached to some men when we're not sure what's going on, right? We'll have bothersome symptoms, could be pain, could be urinary, and it could be a histologic diagnosis, which technically it should be. But the prevalence is 5 to 13% in the United States, and over 2 million hospital visits per year are attributed to this condition. It was seen in over three quarters of the men on the reduced trial. There's a variety of classifications for prostatitis, acute and chronic bacterial, inflammatory, non-inflammatory, and asymptomatic. And it was suggested to be causative for BPH as early as the 1930s. So what about its relationship to cancer? Well, in the California Men's Health Study, nearly 70,000 men were involved, and the relative risk was 1.3, and this was significant. And if you, the men had a longer duration of prostatitis, they had even higher risk. And then a meta-analysis of 20 studies also showed a significant association. Research has shown that daily intake of NSAIDs, primarily aspirin, has been associated with a 39 to 66% risk reduction for prostate cancer. Um, this was surprising to me, but if you're going to try to tie inflammation and cancer together, it somewhat makes sense. Uh, by a show of hands, how many people advise men to consider uh, NSAIDs for cancer prevention? Yeah, so nobody, right? So, but the data is there, but you know, whether or not it's quality data and whether or not it's had any impact on practice patterns uh, appears unlikely. So what about the microbiome? You heard me mention this at the beginning. So we now have the ability to do an analysis through molecular-based assays. The prostate is not a sterile environment, just like the data has shown that the urine is not as sterile as, we, as often as we thought it was. The bacterial populations within the prostate seem to differ in the setting of benign and malignant disease. And it's unclear, however, which promotes which. Does one type of environment favor certain types of bacteria, or do the bacteria then change the environment? So the concept of infection resulting in cancer is not a new concept, right? Virchow, or Virchow's triad, right? Back in the 1800s. And we're all familiar with the example of H. pylori as it relates to gastric disease. Now this relationship was first proposed for prostate cancer going back to the early 1950s. And some association uh, between prostate cancer risk and gene variants of COX-2, um, RNA, uh, RNA-L, uh, and uh, toll-like uh, receptor protein 4 have been identified in cases of hereditary prostate cancer. So just to review, COX-2, remember COX inhibitors, right? You're thinking about inflammation. RNA-L is going to be mostly for protection uh, against viral disorders, right, through the interferon pathway. And toll-like receptor 4 recognizes the LPS, or the lipopolysaccharidase, of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. So in radical prostatectomy specimen analysis has shown over 70% contain enterobacter. So what about this? Probionobacterum acnes, or P. acnes. It's abundant within prostate tissue. It's also abundant within vaginal tissue, and it's frequently found in the urine. And it population is increased by men taking testosterone, right? Think back to uh, puberty, right? It has a pro-inflammatory role and has been associated with prostate cancer and has been found absent in normal tissue, so it's been suggested as both an, an initiator or a promoter for disease. It's been reported in 78 to 95 percent of prostate cancer specimens and 100 percent of pin lesions predictive of cancer on subsequent biopsies for elevated PSA. Okay. So we're coming back to our questions. We're going to do these again, right? 
So among the soft tissues in the human body, the prostate is the highest level of which of the following? Awesome. All right. Let's go to the next one. Again, research has noted which of the following in the majority of tested prostate cancer specimens and high-grade pin or pin lesions. Fantastic. So in conclusion, the prostate is an immunocompetent, androgen-dependent organ of fertility, but the direct target for a number of both benign and malignant diseases. Impairment of the status of the epithelium can decrease accumulation of zinc and citrate, and it can affect calocrine secretion. Inflammation is associated with both BPH and prostate cancer, but the data cannot truly confirm causality.